So I planned to do this speech entirely through poetry, um, but I, I couldn't find anything that rhymed with social impact bond. So if anyone, if anyone's got any ideas, please, please do let me know. Um, so I think, you know, leading off from that, although we as Bridges haven't invested uh, directly into Mayday yet, we've had a lot of discussions and a lot of chats about their model, um, and there's a number of themes that really resonate with us. Um, and, you know, focus on outcomes, obviously, um, and the, the sort of flexibility at the core um, of the programme uh, are all really important things we, we think about a lot um, from, from our perspective. Um, and so they've invited me to talk a little bit about social investment um, and innovation, um, and particularly in relation to, to um, asset-based models. Um, social investment, as I think um, Neris alluded to, is not a panacea, I'm sorry. Um, it is, like all good financing, it, can, it is only impactful to the degree it can help things to happen. So it's only of use if it can really um, help scale um, organisations who want to deliver a positive social impact. It does behave differently, um, it does work differently, but, it, but it fundamentally it is solely about helping those provider organisations who really want to make a difference and want to scale and grow. Um, and there's a whole broad spectrum of social investment, and a lot, particularly in the housing sector and the homelessness sector. Um, but I sort of, you know, for sake of time, um, I thought I'd really just focus in on social impact bonds and one social impact bonds we're invested in. Um, I think it highlights uh, the opportunity around innovation um, and some of the stuff we've been talking about today. Um, so social impact bonds have a um, mixed reputation, uh, I guess. You know, a lot of people think they're um, they could be overly complex and difficult, and 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 they sat and the name sounds a bit intimidating sometimes. But fundamentally, they're they're quite simple. Um, they start with a commissioner who has an outcomes contract, so it's payment by results for social outcomes that the commissioner has defined. Um, a provider wins that contract and uh, they start delivering the services. To deliver the services takes cost, startup, um, you know, resources. Um, and after a period of time, they start to achieve the outcomes, they get paid for those outcomes, um, and then they can start covering the costs of the program. So the social impact bond is really just the funding for that first bit, just startup capital, very simply, to, to get the program started and going. Once the program is going, once it's successful, once you know you're going to achieve the results you said you would, then, um, once all the program costs have been covered, um, then the investor starts to get repaid their capital, and they aim to get their capital back if they can. Um, but that is completely dependent on achieving the outcomes um, of the program and being successful. So we're completely aligned with the provider who wants to maximise outcomes, who, is, who should be completely aligned with the commissioner who wants maximum outcomes. Um, so that's how it works. So it is, in essence, it's, it's that startup funding. But um, I think as the previous speech said, it's not just about the money. Um, as social investors, we are engaged, supportive, challenging. Um, we provide constructive challenging and a different viewpoint. Um, we build capacity where it's needed, um, and we help with data systems and all the rest of it. It's a, it's a typical area that that's needed. Um, we don't suggest the you know, change to the front line. We're not experts in frontline services and delivery, um, and don't pretend to be. Um, but rather, we're helping helping run the contract in the most effective way, and helping Im embed the aspects of innovation which I'll talk about. So there are two, two ways in which this relationship between provider and investor drives innovation. Um, the first one is that you know, if, if you are a smaller organization or a social sector organization, it is very hard to bid for outcomes contracts for payment by results because of the risk around the finances. So the fact that we are able to invest that money means that more people can bid and different ideas can come to the table. And I think that's part of what drives innovation, is you, you have a broader conversation, more people pitching in their ideas, locally sourced, locally, locally derived. Um, <coughs> that can really, really broaden the, the, um, the set, of, um, set of approaches and ideas and participants in the market, and that drives innovation. Um, and obviously, as I said, as investor, we take the risk on that. Um, and as Pat was talking about before, there is a risk when you're trying something like this, so, so that's very real. But that's what, you know, part of the reason of social investment. The second thing is that the structure, when you're in project delivery, really embeds that sort of dynamic environment of learning. Um, you know, learning is not just sort of um, welcomed, it's absolutely necessary and fundamental. It is fundamental that you keep refining the model to improve the outcomes and improve performance. Um, and I think as Neris wonderfully said, you know, you embrace the mess. <laughs> you see what works, you see what doesn't work, and you scale what's working, and you refine what isn't. I mean, it's, 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 it's a really good way of articulating it. So I do think, you know, the social investment bit's important, and, you know, in the innovation. 
Um, but it's only relevant in the context of the outcomes contract. So there has to be an outcomes contract um, from, from the social impact bond perspective and from our perspective. Um, and we've seen the growth of those outcomes contracts in the social pol the range of social policy areas, including homelessness. Um, and we, we think, you know, from our experience in investing in some of these contracts, we think it's a good thing. Um, from the commissioner perspective, you know, the commissioner only pays when they achieve an outcome. Um, so that helps achieve that, that value for money, as long as the outcomes are defined in the right way. But in doing that, in simply focusing on the outcomes, the, um, that really frees the provider up to work flexibly to deliver what needs to be delivered to, to, make, you know, to achieve those outcomes. Um, and you know, that's, that's really the precondition for both of those innovation aspects I talked about. You need that flexibility and ability to suggest a completely different bonkers model, which may or may not work, but you, know, you, you want to try it and you've got some, some idea that it will. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying you can't do some of these things in other contracts, it's just that when, you have, when you're paid on outcomes, the incentives are really clearly aligned to what's, what's the outcome you want for this person? Okay, drive for that outcome however, however is best. Um, and if you achieve it, then you'll be paid for it. So, so just to focus on one, one sort of key example, um, uh, Fair Chance Fund, we, we invested in three projects under the Fair Chance Fund, which might be familiar to some people in the room. Um, it was, uh, cohort was 18 to 24 year olds who were homeless and neat. Um, we recruited for the first year and then our cohort was capped um, and we carried on working, well we're still working with them actually, we're 18 months in, but that meant that we had to work with everyone who was recruited um, and really, you know, there was no, no chance to skim or to, um, or, or any of those perverse incentives. Um, payments are made for moving into accommodation, sustaining accommodation, moving into education, just, um, achieving an outcome in education and moving into employment, sustaining employment. Um, and in terms of that first driver, you know, the different ideas, we backed three totally different bits, really, really different. Very community-based one, another one that was, um, took a kind of multidisciplinary team approach, and another one that was very, um, very support worker focused, and it was just, there were three, three very different models, and now we're a year and a half in, we're seeing very different outcomes. All are delivering good outcomes, but in very different ways. Um, and that's relevant, you know, that's important, both because they've got different individuals, different cohorts on their projects, but also the housing market is different in different places, so it's, it's really responding to that. Um, and in terms of the, the second component of innovation, that sort of refinement and, and driving the innovation as you're, as you're going through the project, um, full flexibility just means we can really tailor the offer, um, means we can change it. We found out that on one project, around a quarter of the cohort were formerly looked after children, which wasn't meant to be um, what this program was for, but because of the way the systems worked there, that's what happened. Um, and that meant that we had to change how we were focusing our project delivery. Um, we also found there was higher mental health requirements than, than perhaps had been expected, so we had to bring in some more formal mental health support. So it really did give that, that ability to, to tailor it. Um, and I think sort of, you know, another component of it is it's a three-year program, so we have to keep these young people engaged for three years. Um, which is quite difficult. So often when these young people came to us, they were in crisis and they needed that immediate support. But how, but they may not want to um, stay involved with a service that was there for them at that bad time, they might want to move on. So we've spent so much time thinking about how do you actively change the nature of the support, change the <coughs> engagement and change the model going, going forward through those three years to really keep people engaged. Um, and yeah, I think that program is really having fantastic results um, seen much lower uh, dropout rates than, than perhaps we would expect in on comparable programs. But for me, it was really that's really it was a good outcomes contract, but it was a kind of first generation outcomes contract. It focused on you know accommodation, employment, education, and so I think there's a real opportunity now, and particularly with the model that we're talking about today. How do you think about that next generation? Um, was it Captain Kirk first generation? This is Jean Luc Picard. Um, <laughs> sorry for the geeky reference. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is next generation um, type outcomes commissioning. Um, and really, you know, so the, the outcomes we were delivering were good, but what we want is that independent, self-sustaining person. How do, you better, how do you better align incentives around that? How do you better capture that? How do you capture when someone may have traveled a significant distance from their starting point, but, it, but they haven't achieved employment, sustained employment, all those things, but you know you've had an impact. In Fair Chance Fund, it doesn't, it, it pays for some of that, but not all of it. So I really think thinking through those things is, is critical too. Um, so I think, you know, for me, that's why, why this model is so interesting. 
Um, the ability to really track distance travelled is exciting. You know, um, the data is rigorous. Um, we had a very good presentation. I think, I think maybe you could teach them into the polling agencies at the moment ahead of tomorrow um, <laughs> to a little more around that that data rigor. Um, and also, you know, the the asset based model feels like it's a very very good proxy for the outcomes we're trying to achieve for people, um, and and therefore, you know, really really helps helps articulate that perhaps in a better way than than some of the uh, the um, the outcomes we we talked about previously. So I'll stop there. Just in summary, you know, social investment can drive innovation um, in terms of how it works with partners. We've seen that in Fair Chance Fund and the Rough Sleeping SIP. Um, two levels, there's a, the project concept and initiation, and then there's this kind of delivery and refinement as you go on. Um, and I think to, to commissioners, really, the, the, the question is how, you know, we know it's a tough funding environment and we know it's, a, you know, the pressures on the system are immense. How can we take components of what we've learned from Fair Chance and other outcome schemes and this asset-based model? How can we pull aspects of that out and say, okay, you know, we would like to embed outcomes commissioning into our commissioning <coughs> process to some degree. How does that happen effectively? And providers and investors like me, I think, you know, it's up to us to sort of try, keep driving the innovation and keep coming up um, with these fantastic ideas. So no pressure. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you.